All right, bros, it's time. Spooky season is here, meaning it's time for jack-o'-lanterns, pumpkin spice lattes, and burning the local witch at the stake. She promised butthole pictures, and all we got are plague on our crops. Off with her head. Jokes aside, I think the best way to slide into October is to talk about probably one of the greatest films of all time. Hello, Reagan. Do you know what she did? <laughs> Your canting daughter? Give us time! Let her die! I am no one! I am no one! Be unto her, O oh Lord, a fortified tower in the face of the enemy. <laughs> Jesus! Fuck you! Fuck you! I'm only planning to stay in rain until she rots and lies stinking in the earth. Well, then, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Damien Karras. And I'm the devil. Now kindly undo these straps. Yep, The Exorcist. Now, it feels weird even trying to introduce this movie. It's probably one of the most famous horror films of all time, if not the most. With so many different parodies, references, and even memes about the film that have kept it in the public conscience for a full 50 years. And this is one of those cases where if you claim to be a film buff or a horror aficionado, this is mandatory viewing. No two ways about it. A horror fan that hasn't seen The Exorcist is kind of like meeting a sci-fi fan that's never heard of Star Wars. The whole idea just kind of sounds ridiculous. But the funny part about all of this is that the reputation around the movie can give outsiders a different idea of what the film is actually about. Everyone knows the famous parts of The Exorcist. A possessed little girl, a priest coming over to help her, stuff flying around the room, twisting her head backwards, vomiting pea soup. Yeah, you, you get the idea. The Tubular Bells theme, that song that everyone knows as The Exorcist Song. God, you can play that to anyone and they'll immediately tell what the movie is. And the face of the little girl possessed by the demon went on to be used as the jump scare in the Scary Maze game, which was probably one of the most famous shock sites. God knows how many different videos of people freaking out at the jump scare to that game flooded YouTube back in the day. <laughs> But actually sitting down and watching The Exorcist is a completely different beast than what you might have in mind. So let's take a step back and add some context. The Exorcist is the 1973 film adaptation of the novel written by William Peter Blatty, who also served as the screenwriter. The film was directed by William Friedkin and stars Ellen Burstyn, Max von Sydow, Jason Miller, and most famously Linda Blair. Though there's another really iconic actor to the movie, but that's somebody I'll have to talk about a bit later. Just know that her name is Mercedes McCambridge, and you never physically see her on screen. Now, the story is so well known that it's a little weird to give a synopsis, and to be frank, I'm gonna be kinda loosey-goosey with spoilers, simply because everyone knows the ending to The Exorcist. Still, here we go. Sometime in Washington, D.C. during the early 70s, a famous actress by the name of Chris McNeil notices that her daughter is showing extreme personality shifts, going from a sweet and kind little girl, being violent, vulgar, and even committing self-harm. Chris is scrambling to figure out what's going on with her child as the behavior escalates, but every doctor she talks to is clueless on how to help. At the same time, Damien Karras, a local psychiatrist and Catholic priest who works in the seminary as a counselor for other priests, has a crisis of faith as he deals with being separated from his elderly mother, since her health is starting to fail. She lives in New York all alone while he's in Georgetown, and the crisis grows bad enough that he considers leaving the seminary, unsure of whether or not he's good enough to really help anyone while he's struggling in his own personal life. The first thing to really note about the story of The Exorcist is that it's not as bombastic as modern possession movies, which is really funny because almost every movie that's done the demon possesses somebody concept has taken large chunks of The Exorcist DNA and basically tried to run with it and do their own thing. Now, another detail a lot of people like to quote about this movie is that it's based off an actual quote-unquote story of a demonic possession, but a lot of the details are shifted around for the sake of making it a fictional story. Like, for one, it's unambiguous whether or not it's a demon. It's a demon. But also, the boy in the case is a boy, while well, they change it to a little girl for the story. It also happened in Maryland, while The Exorcist takes place in Washington, D.C. Bloody was inspired by the story since it was something he heard while he was in college, but he only took it as a basis to write a larger novel on top of it. He didn't want to directly adapt what happened. Regardless of this, however, he still wanted to keep it a grounded, human story. And this is carried over into the the tone of the film. It's a very slow-paced thriller, with a ton of build-up to get to the quote-unquote scary parts. In fact, those really famous moments you see all the time in parodies or references show up in the last 30 minutes or so. Read, nigga! Read! Ah! Oh! 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 
try to join in. Use your power for hand. Let's whoop this nigga ass. Repeat after me the holy phrase. Nigga, get your black ass out of here. Nigga, get your black ass out of here. Yeah, it's kind of funny in retrospect. Not only that, but the characters don't even really know it's a demon until the final act. Which, once again, you see how much the public really emphasized little girl possessed by a demon, and you kind of see how much everyone kind of forgot in retrospect. I mean, for one, a major conflict in the movie is that the characters don't even really know it's a demon until the finale. Some might think that's ridiculous, especially since some scenes show very obvious supernatural behavior, but this is a part that I really enjoy. An aspect of the film that damn near every contemporary completely ignores and that is the characters are extremely well written. William Peter Blatty is a very talented author, and he excelled especially in making characters feel authentic. He's very good at writing dialogue, as some of the interactions between characters are very memorable and charming. This helps keep the film interesting to watch, even if it doesn't have spooky demon creepiness every 10 minutes. And because the characters are so believable, it's understandable why they make the decisions that they do. When I said that it takes up until the final act for them to realize it's a demon, I mean it, because they try every other solution in the book before resorting to an exorcism. Reagan is taken to all sorts of doctors, hospitals, and put through tons of examinations, some involving entire surgeries, such as the infamous cerebral angiography scene, up until it finally clicks. Chris, her mother, is hysterical through the entire ordeal, since all she knows is that her daughter snapped one day and is hurting herself. She doesn't know what the hell is going on and just wants someone to help her child, and she becomes more and more desperate as every door is slammed in her face. The biggest part of what makes The Exorcist interesting is that these are all rational, reasonable people put into a situation where reason and logic are thrown out the window. Most other movies after this have characters running to a church and asking a priest or a shaman to bless a house if they smell ghost bullshit. It's outright a cliche at this point. They call a priest and they give exposition about why the demon has such a big power level, and some jargon bullshit about why the love of Christ can't break their jaw. Everyone knows the scene by this point. It's in everything from paranormal activity to Amityville horror. Well, the thing is, The Exorcist is sort of one of the stories that started the cliche, since a major aspect of the film is building up to the Catholic intervention. Having the exorcism take place is the moment of the film, since it's when the characters embrace the fact that nothing about the situation makes sense, and they have to rely on literal faith to save Reagan. So, tons of horror movies afterwards bring up exorcisms or priests to basically diffuse the idea in order to make the entity scarier. Now, this is kind of a hot take, but I'm still gonna stick by it. Exorcist doesn't really scare me. Like, at all. But there's a reason for it. I've liked horror movies since I was a kid and watched a ton as the years go by. However, The Exorcist is something I checked out pretty late into the game. It wasn't until after high school that I finally sit down and watch the movie. And by then, it simply didn't freak me out. I wasn't even creeped out, it just didn't get to me. But I will say that even at the time I watched it, I thought it was one of the greatest movies ever made. Completely fell in love with it, and it's something I can easily put on and watch when Halloween season comes around. And a big aspect is how rich and matter-of-fact the movie is. I already talked about the characters, how them acting like rational people makes the situation feel like a real problem that they're struggling to solve, and that's just one part of it. The film doesn't try to scare the audience. There's very few cases where they try to shock the viewer. I mean, there's no orchestra string mixed with loud noise, or even really gratuitous violence, beyond like, one or two scenes. The scary parts of The Exorcist are all conceptual, seeing a small child be tormented and hurt herself, and the creeping dread of seeing this demon take more and more control over her, and when you realize that the demon wants people to bumble around trying to find the answer, since every wrong solution means putting Reagan through more suffering. Now, at the time the movie came out, a lot of the scenes were probably extremely shocking. Having a young girl spew profanities, have surgeries performed on her, scream in agony from a demon torturing her, even forcibly masturbating with a crucifix. These were all handled by the stunt double, by the way. They didn't go full cuties. But the point is, this definitely would have freaked people out in 1973. But come 2022, it's honestly extremely tame. Now, that's just from the idea of it being scary. It's still pretty disturbing, since there's a very clear metaphor for mental illness and how the treatment of children who develop severe disorders are handled, but there's a difference between disturbing and scary. Of course, horror is a very subjective genre. Some people might find The Exorcist to be the scariest movie ever made, others might view it as a comedy. It's just how it is. Still, the point is that it doesn't indulge itself or try to spruce up any of the supernatural elements. It simply points a camera at it and records what happens. 
It's especially interesting due to the grounded tone, since the story takes these events extremely seriously, and you can see the clear separation when you go from Reagan throwing tantrums and cursing people out, to her entire bed shaking and everything in the room flying all over the place, and the characters themselves address these things. Chris McNeil's entire arc is that she starts thinking that she's losing her mind, as the obvious supernatural invasion into her life gets more blatant, when she tries to explain the events that simply should not be possible to a character that wasn't there themselves, they brush her off, and they think it's all in her head, with probably the biggest example being when Reagan spins her head backwards, which is confirmation that she killed a man named Burke Dennings, the personal friend of her mother and film director she was working with when the story begins. He died by being pushed down the stairway leading to their home, breaking his neck, and twisting his head all the way backwards. Perfectly plain, you're a teacher of the college, you don't want the building torn down. Come on, I can read for Well, what's wrong? Do you know what she did? Ya canting daughter! Yeah, but you never knew that scene is there to confirm a little girl is a full-blown murderer. You just thought it was spooky bullshit. Granted, Reagan didn't kill Burke Dennings. It was the demon controlling her, but the point applies. And the best part of all of this is that this still isn't enough to convince some characters of the presence of a demon. Now you might think this is a sign of complete and total retardation. But remember, unless somebody was physically there and saw the presence of the supernatural, all they have to go by is the word of a hysterical mother scrambling to figure out what's wrong with her mentally ill daughter. And it's not like characters don't address the possibility of a demon, they simply go with the interpretation that Reagan has a split personality that pretends to be a demon and makes her do bad things. They're still convinced that she's either faking her symptoms or has some schizoaffective disorder that basically makes her unable to control her behavior. Because let's be honest here, what rational human being would immediately leap to it's a demon, which once again leads into probably one of my favorite details about The Exorcist. The maturity of the characters extends to the seminary and the priests. Now I know the Catholic Church has had some serious controversies over the years, putting it very lightly, but The Exorcist came out before this dirty little secret was revealed, and the story is using the church for a role that doesn't work without showing a better side to the audience. Also, frankly, the pedophile priest cliche tends to blind people to how extensive the issue of child exploitation really is in society. Don't believe me? Look up the rates of public school teachers getting caught diddling kids. It's a dark rabbit hole that does not discriminate. The point is that The Exorcist doesn't treat their characters as stereotypes or symbols. These are supposed to be living, breathing people that embody the better parts of mankind. Every human character in the story has good intentions. They want to help Reagan. These are doctors, these are detectives, these are psychiatrists, they're professionals. They simply don't know how to handle the presence of a demon. It clearly believes that people are good, that they're smart and want to tackle issues carefully. They can be assholes, but end of the day, they will absolutely help a little girl they see is in trouble. Vladdy himself was a devout Catholic and was very close to the church. So he wanted to portray them as an organization filled with people, instead of any kind of symbol. Hell, it was the doctors that suggest the idea of the exorcism. They believe the only way to tackle Reagan's mental illness is to use the power of suggestion in their favor, to make her think she's being exorcised and force out the split personality by essentially play-acting the ritual. Damien himself completely tackles the issue from from the perspective of a psychiatrist instead of a priest. Could you see her? Yes, I could. I could see her as a psychiatrist, but I can't oh, see her. Oh, not a psychiatrist. She needs a priest. She's already seen every fucking psychiatrist in the world, and they sent me to you. Now you're going to send me back to them? Even when he's about to step into the room with the exorcist himself to perform the ritual, he still views this from the perspective of a girl with mental problems. I think it might be helpful if I gave you some background on the different personalities Reagan has manifested. So far, I'd say there seem to be three. And to his credit, he's got good reasons to believe this is the case. Damien's history of dealing with mental illness gave him experience in spotting delusional behavior, and Reagan does show contradicting signs when he goes to examine her, now fully corrupted and controlled by the demon. I mean, you take a look at her and tell me that's not possession, dude. I'm sorry. Still, there's evidence such as her claiming she is the devil himself instead of a specific demon. Look, your daughter doesn't say she's a demon. She says she's the devil himself. Now, if you've seen as many psychotics as I have, you'd realize that's the same thing as saying you're Napoleon Bonaparte. Reacting to tap water being thrown at her like it was holy water, stuff like that. Damien is an educated psychiatrist. It doesn't matter that he works in a church. The dude is not an idiot or a crazy Bible thumper. But this is where the demon really shows its layers. I feel like I've wasted enough time, so let's talk about probably the most underrated aspect of The Exorcist. The actual portrayal of the demon itself. 
I am fully willing to say, The Exorcist has probably one of the best demons ever put on film. You see, a big issue with a lot of paranormal or possession movies is that the entities tend to just be forces of nature. They're just a malevolent entity that throws stuff around, fucks with your head, and tries to kill you. This can work in its own right. Stuff like Juon works perfectly well, uh, movies like Gonjium Haunted Asylum. These do the force of nature style of haunting extremely well. But what makes the demon in The Exorcist so memorable is the fact that it's an actual character. It is a complete force of evil, yet there's so much more to it than that. The demon isn't just violent and cruel. It's very manipulative. It wants to tear down anyone it sees. It doesn't want to just kill them. It wants to make these people suffer. And seeing how it contrasts with Damien makes up some of my favorite scenes in the whole movie. Damien Karras is a good man. He's kind to the people around him, and he always thinks of others before himself. His entire crisis of faith kicks off because he feels guilty over not being able to help his mother. He sees her suffering at home alone, with her brother unable to help due to neither of the men having enough money to take care of her. In fact, his uncle feeds into the problem, since he kind of resents Damien for joining the seminary instead of opening a private practice and becoming a successful psychiatrist. He's not malevolent or anything, simply frustrated, but it just so happens that Damien blames himself for the whole situation. And the thing is, the demon knows all of this. Your mother sit here with his cash. Would you like to leave a message? I see that she gets it. It's able to pick up on his insecurities and play his ego against himself. In fact, this is one of the big events that causes Damien to consider it a demonic possession, since Reagan mocks the death of his mother when the girl herself never even met the man before the examination. Did you know my mother died recently? Yes, I did. I'm very sorry. No. Is Reagan aware of it? Not at all. The demon essentially views Damien as a toy playing into the preconception he has that Reagan is just crazy, while mocking him by dangling the truth in front of his face. Another sign of this is when they talk in different languages. One of the signs that the Catholic Church views as evidence of possession is the victim speaking in languages they've never studied or knew. Damien actually talks with Reagan in Latin and French, something a young American girl probably would not have studied. But the phrases used are very simple, something a kid probably could stumble into if they wanted to study other languages. The exact phrases used are this. Mirable dictu, ego te absolvo, bonjour, and la pluma de montante. Mirable dictu is Latin for wonderful to relate, and the context of the scene is that Damien is challenging the idea that Reagan is actually possessed by the demon, and capable of performing telekinesis, as a drawer opens on its own, and Damien asks if she's capable of doing it again. Do it again. In time. No, no. In time. Mirable dictu, don't you agree? Essentially, it's playing with Damien by not giving him a firm confirmation that it is a demon. It wants to keep that doubt in his mind, while still poking fun at a man of God for staring a demon in the face. Now the next phrase, ego te absolvo, is another Latin phrase, standing for I absolve you. This is a mocking joke at Damien after he asks Reagan if she can actually speak Latin. You speak Latin. Ego te absolvo. Both confirming its knowledge of the language, and once again trying to provoke Damien by making fun of his job as a priest. After this, Damien tries to dig further by asking quad nomen mihi est, which translates simply to what is my name. It's his attempt to see if Reagan knows any more Latin beyond the simple phrases she said before, if she can respond to a question she might not be familiar with, or if she just memorized specific responses. But the demon doesn't take the bait. Quad nomen mihi est? Bonjour. Merely going bonjour and switching to French out of nowhere. This is also where La Plume de Montante comes from, and I have no idea if I'm saying that right, it's French, I don't care. It's a simple phrase that means from the pen of my aunt, which is a common introductory phrase for children learning French. Quad nomen mihi est? Bonjour. Quad nomen mihi est? La Plume de Montante. Ah! How long are you planning to stay in Reagan? The demon wants Damien to doubt its very existence while getting into his head and using his problems against him. The only time the demon is truly honest is when it resorts to speaking in tongues, backwards English where it screams out how it wants Reagan to suffer and die, but also shows a fear of a priest known as Father Marin. Now, Father Marin shows up in the prologue of the film, working as a historian in Iraq, digging up the ancient ruins in the area, along the way discovering a medal that belongs to St. Joseph and a statue representing the demon known as Pazuzu. Now, Pazuzu is a real character in Mesopotamian mythology, but is, funny enough, seen as a protective figure, 
safeguarding pregnant women and new mothers against the demon known as Lamashtu, who steals babies to eat them alive. However, he is still considered an evil entity due to being the cause of famines and called the king of the evil wind demons. The Exorcist takes liberties with the mythology, mainly by implying that Pazuzu is a servant of Satan that is purely malicious and actually attacks women and children, and this is under the assumption that the references to the Pazuzu entity aren't just red herrings, since that is still very possible. Remember that the demon wants to manipulate people and mix truth with the lies. The funny part is that modern media has completely embraced the idea that Pazuzu is explicitly a demonic being in the Judeo-Christian sense while forgetting that it's technically a character from Mesopotamian mythology. Now, a lot of people like to poke fun at the name Pazuzu, viewing it as another case of the silly demon name that horror movies like to include. The funny part is that neither the novel or the film ever actually name drop Pazuzu. There are obvious hints, and the novel does imply that it might be the demon, but it never goes out of its way to say exactly what the entity possessing Reagan actually is. It's just a demon, and that's a million times more interesting than giving a clear answer. This is supposed to be an entity that doesn't make much sense, and it loves throwing people into a tailspin, but its fear of Father Marin is one of the elements that really makes the demon feel like a character in the setting more than a spooky monster. Marin actually exorcised this same demon before from a child in Africa, a process that took months and nearly killed him. And ever since, the demon has actually shown a fear of the man, seeing him as one of the few threats that can actually harm it. Marin's presence at the end of the film is when the whole thing goes into overdrive. The guy shows up and he's immediately getting to work, demanding Damien fetch holy water, warning him of the tactics the entity will try to use against them, and shutting down his insistence that this is a split personality. I think it might be helpful if I gave you some background on the different personalities Reagan has manifested. So far I'd say there seem to be three. She's convinced that There's she's- There's only one. Marin represents the other side to this issue. He's not consumed by doubt or skepticism. He is steadfast and knows that it's a demon. He's unwavering in the face of literal evil. The demon can't lie or manipulate him, since Marin knows what it is. So it focuses its attacks purely against Damien, the weak link of the two. And sadly, this actually works, with Damien taken out of the room due to emotional distress and Marin dying due to a heart attack, implied to be the work of the demon. But this causes Damien to throw all doubt out the window, physically beating Reagan and demanding the demon to enter him instead, which might have actually been the goal of the demon since the beginning, since Damien had cryptic dreams about its presence long before he ever met met Reagan. Plus some of the statements it made during the examinations, it almost wanted the exorcism to take place. What an excellent day for an exorcism. But wouldn't that drive you out of Reagan? It would bring us together. You and Reagan. You and us. And it almost won, except Damien decides to yeet himself out the bedroom window, committing suicide with the demon still inside of him in order to force it back into hell. Now, some people view this ending as the demon winning, viewing the suicide as something the demon made Damien do instead of an act of rebellion, and if you view The Exorcist as a self-contained story, this is a legitimate take. But the sequel, Legion, makes it very clear that it was Damien fighting back instead. And speaking of the sequels, let's talk about them real quick. For one, Exorcist 2 never happened. It never happened. It's a shit movie, and it was made by a director that didn't even like the original. It completely misses the point of what made the first movie special. Watch the best the worst episode by Red Letter Media talking about the movie, because I sure fucking won't. We have an in-movie example of the Spanish lady. Yeah. Who, who was a healer. Yeah. And Pazuzu got a hold of her and was eventually burned. Okay. So he got rid of that healer. Okay. So he was trying to get rid of Linda Hamilton. William Peter Blatty himself disowned it. The fourth movie, the prequel, which technically has two versions that are basically two different movies but still the exact same, also never happened. It's a cheap demon possession movie that has signs of interesting stuff, such as actually exploring the incident in Africa that Marin dealt with, but becomes a cliche horror movie like anything else. He literally has to chase it into a cave. Now, Exorcist 3, that's a special something. For context, Exorcist 2 put the franchise straight into the grave. You had a first movie that went on to win Academy Awards and become the highest grossing R-rated horror film until the 2017 remake of Stephen King's It, so of course the studio rushed out a shitty sequel that was a bad attempt at a surrealist abstract psychological horror. That's not even saying surrealist horror is bad. This is just bad surrealist horror. But the point is all the hype was squashed. Of course, some people argue that The Exorcist never needed a sequel in the first place. 
place. It works fine just on its own. What's the point of stretching out a perfectly self-contained story? It especially didn't help that William Peter Blatty had zero involvement in Exorcist 2 and directly hated it. This seems like a flash in the pan that will never see a new installment, and maybe it doesn't even need one. However, William Peter Blatty disagreed. He wrote a sequel novel called Legion, taking place a full 15 years after the events of the original. The book became another hit earning the chance at another film adaptation. Blatty was actually picked up to both write and direct the sequel. This wasn't his full directorial debut, however, since he directed the ninth configuration beforehand, which is pretty good. While this is technically a sequel to the Exorcist film, it's even directly called Exorcist 3, this serves more as an adaptation to the book than a sequel to the movie. It's weird, but it'll make more sense when I talk about some plot stuff. Now, Exorcist 3 is good. In fact, it's very good. All of the strengths that I mentioned for Exorcist 1, the very strong cast of characters, ability to flesh them out, it's all present. Of course, there are some stark differences between 1 and 3. For one, Legion takes place a full 15 years after the events of the original, and the movie itself released a full 17 years after Exorcist 1. Barely anyone from the original novel shows up again. The McNeils are gone, only getting a reference to their ordeal and its ties to the plot for 3, and the story focuses completely on Detective Kinderman. Uh, Kinderman was a supporting character who arrived in the original to investigate the death of Burke Dennings. He doesn't have much screen time in the movie, but he showed up a lot more in the book. But he has now fully become a protagonist come Legion. He also befriends Father Dyer, the kind-hearted priest that was also Damien's best friend in the original. The two bond over the death of Damien and later become like brothers. What are you doing? I need some lemon drops. We'll be late for the start of the picture. I once spent a year hearing children's confessions and I wound up a lemon drop junkie. Little weirdos keep breathing it on you along with all that pot and between the two of them, I've got a feeling it's probably addictive. Now, Kinderman was played by Lee J. Cobb in the original movie, while in Legion, he is played by George C. Scott. It's sort of a strange recast since Kinderman was already a middle-aged man in the original, but if you're going to get a new actor, you may as well go balls out and get one of the best of all time. This was actually one of George C. Scott's final roles, by the way, and sadly, he got panned. It wasn't even like he did a bad job, it's just you have this classical actor do this terrible little horror movie if you listen to critics. Disregard all that, he's really good in the movie. The story of Legion is a far cry from the original. Exorcist 1 focused completely on the destruction of Reagan and the struggles to figure out what the hell is going on with her, while well, Exorcist 3 is a murder mystery. I shit you not, the plot follows Kinderman as he discovers a new series of murders that are eerily similar to the killings performed by the Gemini Killer years prior. However, the Gemini Killer was confirmed dead. This is actually where the differences between the book and the movie come in, since in the book the Gemini was shot by the police but never fully confirmed dead, as his body went missing, while in the movie it's extremely clear he died, outright executed by electric chair. There are other differences but I'm saving them for later, this was kind of a weird production. The point is that the killings are back and matching details that were never released to the public, the first victim of the new spree being a young black child who is decapitated and crucified on rowing oars, with the head of a Jesus statue painted in blackface replacing the head. Kinderman is shaken by the killings, going through his own personal crisis much like Damien from the original, only he's a lot more bitter about his problems, outright asking Father Dyer whether God truly cares for mankind if he allows such horrible things to happen. Would a God who is good invent something like death? Plainly speaking, it's a lousy idea. It's not popular, Father. It's not a winner. Exorcist 1 is a pretty positive story in regards to how it views people. Characters have good intentions, they're intelligent, and the only truly evil thing is the demon, while Legion takes a more misanthropic view of the world. It focuses on a homicide detective investigating a serial killer. You see how frustrated Kinderman is with the world, and how he's sorta of trapped viewing the negative side of things. And to make matters all the worse, his investigation leads him to a hospital that's holding a mysterious patient who looks very familiar. Yep. The demon from the original actually resurrected Damien Karras, possessing his body and forcing in the soul of the Gemini Killer, using him as a vehicle for a new wave of killings. The movie even went as far as recasting Jason Miller as Karras, which I think was a really nice touch. Now, the Gemini Killer himself is played by Brad Dourif, who is... Nah, fuck it. Just take a look. The Gemini is dead. No, I am not! I'm alive! I go on! I breathe! Look at me! Look at me! And tell me what you see! Yeah, this dude is incredible as the Gemini Killer. You might be confused why he shows up on screen when the idea is that Damien is possessed. Well, the reason for that is because Exorcist 3 does dip a bit more into the surrealism that 2 attempted, but it's used far better. 
When the Gemini is in control, we see his true form on screen, but to all the other characters, all they see is Damien Karras. This actually comes down to a personal issue that production was dealing with with Jason Miller. At the time, they wanted him to completely play the Gemini, but he was struggling with alcoholism and specifically alcoholic encephalitis. He had trouble remembering his lines due to this issue, so they had Brad Dourif take up the majority of the time on screen. They also wanted to have an effect where they could shift between Brad Dourif and Jason Miller, showing the two men phase between each other in the same shot, but the effect didn't come together how they wanted to, so the idea was dropped. It is sad, because Jason Miller doesn't do a bad job either. While Brad Dourif is very loud and explosive, Miller is far colder and menacing. I still hear from her occasionally, screaming. I think the dead should shut up unless there's something to say. It's two different takes on the same character, and it's actually pretty interesting. There's even small details that remind you that the presence of Brad Dourif is meant to be symbolic. For one, during all of his ranting, you can see that he's crying. Tears are falling down his face and his nose is running. This is because Damien is aware that he's being controlled and is used for brutal killings, but he's powerless to stop it, even praying to God to just kill him and make it all end. He also repeatedly insists that Kinderman tell the press that he is the Gemini killer, even threatening to commit more murders if his agenda is not met. This is because the Gemini is working with the demon. He's still a human being, simply that this serial killer has been enslaved to this entity that's controlling both men, and he's clearly terrified of it, but he's just sort of enjoying the work while he can. The entire plot by the demon is that it wants revenge against Damien for exercising it from Reagan forcing in the Gemini and tormenting him with the knowledge that his body is being used for murder. And not only that, but it wants Damien to be accused of being the Gemini, not only to ruin his legacy, forever branded as a sadistic serial killer, but to create a shocking controversy that would destroy the faith of all those who believe in the church. Yeah, uh, this part didn't age the best. <laughs> Still, the point is that the demon wants to punish Damien by making him look like a murderer. And this is pretty much the whole plot of the movie. Kinnerman is trying to decipher if Karis really is the Gemini, or if the claims of a demon are legit, so instead of a priest with a knowledge of demonology and possessions, you have a homicide detective. It's another case of taking a rational human being and putting them inside of a situation full of just complete irrationality. How the hell can a homicide detective even humor the idea of a demon being the murderer? Especially when the evidence points to other people committing the killings, and Karis never even left the cell once since he was found wandering with no memory. Nothing about it makes sense. Of course, you do learn how the killings actually work, and it's pretty grim and depressing when you really think about it, but I don't want to give away the entire movie. There's just a few things I want to mention before we wrap things up here. For one, Exorcist 3 focuses on the fact Kinderman and Damien were friends. This is one of those quirks I mentioned, since in the original movie, there isn't really anything that screams bros for life. In fact, their first meeting isn't the best. Not to bother you with trivia, but a psychiatrist in sunny California, no less. Was put in jail for not telling the police what he knew about a patient. You know who I think really did it? Who? The Dominicans go pick on them. I could have you deported, you know that? Of course, this is something that the book covers, as there's more time for characters to interact and build relationships. But for the movie, it's a little funny how they mentioned that the two were best friends when they kind of weren't. Another funny thing to mention is that there's multiple endings to the story. I won't go into too much detail on the ending, but there's like three versions. You have the book ending, the original film ending, and then the theatrical ending. The book ending involves the Gemini killer willingly committing suicide after deciding that his work is done, forcing his own heart to stop. The original film ending has Kinderman go into his cell and just shoot him. Jerks, he's got walks in and shoots him and leaves, and I just started laughing out loud. <laughs> Probably 20 years of buildup of me waiting to see the original cut of this movie, and it's just that. Now, the theatrical ending is a lot more theatrical, building up a full climactic showdown with the demon, and even introducing a new priest character to face it. He shows up like twice before the ending, it's very clear he's a product of reshoots. Still, the actual final showdown feels fitting for this kind of story. Reminder that this demon is pissed off at the characters. The original story, it was more of a rabid dog pushed into a corner. It was desperate and almost cowardly, relying on cheap tricks in order to gain power over its victims. Come Legion, however, it unleashes the full power it teased in the first movie, not giving a slight shit. It really feels like this imposing, unstoppable entity. They also bring back the demon voice, with a catch. I will be done. I see we are praying now. 
bright prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Do you think they will save you now as before? And forgive us. They couldn't get the original actress back, Mercedes Mercambridge, since she sued the studio due to being left off the credits of the original film, which is a legitimately shitty thing to do, since she played a pretty major character and did a fantastic job at that. She's part of the identity of the film. Welcome Legion, they instead got Colleen DeWurst, who conveniently was the ex-wife of George C. Scott, and they basically had her do her best impression of the original voice. And I'd say it's pretty uncanny. You wouldn't know it was a different lady if you didn't check. This is actually one of those rare cases where studio interference kind of helped the film, as the more bombastic ending serves as a good payoff to all the strange and out there sequences that Legion includes throughout the film. You have stuff like the dream sequence where Kinderman receives a cryptic warning about the death of another Gemini victim, plus the infamous jump scare, widely seen as one of the best uses of the trope in horror. There are other moments like it, but once again, I don't feel the need to stretch this out any further. The sad part about all of this is that Exorcist 3 was a victim of its own legacy. Due to the failure of 2, audiences were hesitant to take another shot with the series. Funny enough, William Peter Blatty didn't even want to call it Exorcist 3. He correctly guessed that it was a bad idea due to the reputation of 2, but the studio forced the name, and the film did pretty mid in the theaters. And the studio executives went so far as blaming Blatty for naming it Exorcist 3. Despite him warning the suits, it was a bad idea over and over again. Now the reviews were not as negative as they were to 2 but they were still pretty mixed. Some enjoyed the return to a down-to-earth art film, even comparing Blatty favorably to directors like David Lynch, while others viewed 3 as a boring, self-indulgent attempt to revive the Exorcist name. As time went on, there's been kind of a growing cult appreciation for Exorcist 3. Fans view it as the true sequel to the original, and one of the most underrated horror films of all time, a reputation I can certainly agree with. It's not completely perfect. It has some problems. Mainly that it can be pretty slow at points. I'm fine with that. Slow burn movies are, you know, they're, they're pretty good. I like them. But others can view it as padding for time instead of just getting to the point. Still, these are two absolutely fantastic movies. Don't believe me? The Zodiac Killer himself was a big fan of the original. In fact, Blatty used him as the inspiration for the Gemini Killer. And Jeffrey Dahmer was a big fan of Exorcist 3. You gotta be doing something right when two infamous serial killers enjoy your work. That, uh, sounded better in my head. I wanted to shove in this point, but I couldn't find a good excuse, but yeah, this happened. Anyway, you guys should absolutely check out these movies. Avoid the prequels in two, though. They're poo-poo. Don't watch poo-poo, watch good stuff. Also, the show. Yeah, there was a small attempt at an Exorcist TV show back on Fox in, like, 2016-17 timeframe. I have not watched it, but... Surprisingly, it is apparently a pretty faithful adaptation to the franchise. It only lasted two seasons before it got cancelled, but the reviews are very positive, including the audience score, and it even won some awards. I do plan on checking it out, and if it's any good, I'll probably do a video on it, but that's another addition that you guys can enjoy that is probably not poo-poo. Still, you guys should definitely watch this series, put the reputation to the test, and see what you guys think. I absolutely love the first and third movie, and really want you guys to put these on your Halloween lists. You won't regret it. Hopefully, you'll find your next favorite movie. Until next time, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. See you guys. <coughs> I thought you told me there's nothing really wrong with you. There isn't. My brother Eddie had these same stupid symptoms for years. Your brother Eddie died at the age of 30. So what? He got killed in Vietnam. There could have been some connection.
Hey, loser, do you want a shirt? Do you want a t-shirt? I have shirts now. Look in, look in the description for a link to a t-shirt you can buy. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll kill your family. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll poison your dog. If you don't buy the t-shirt, you're going to be the only person in town that does not have a t-shirt. Everyone's going to look at you funny. There's going to be social consequences to not having one of these t-shirts. I'm now making express threats of violence against you if you do not buy my t-shirt. I will call the police, tell them how they're not, you know, you're not buying my shirt. They're going to plant crack in your house, and they're going to arrest you and then beat you up in a jail cell. Buy my shirt.